Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth and final lecture of the Distinguished Visiting Professors Online Series 2022. I'm Professor Bruce McFarlane, Dean of the Faculty of Education and Human Development at the Education University of Hong Kong. This time we are honoured to welcome Professor Ching Gu, who will give a lecture entitled Shaping Futures of Education, Why Leadership Comes First. Professor Jingu is Director of the UCL Centre for Educational Leadership and Professor of Leadership in Education. She is a past Chair of the British Association of Comparative and International Education, co-editor of the journal Teachers and Teaching, Theory and Practice, and a member of the Research Standing Committee of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies, and a member of the Research Evidence and Impact Panel for the UK Leadership College. She is a Senior Research Fellow at the Asia-Pacific Centre for Leadership and Change and Honorary Professor in the Department of Education Policy and Leadership at the Education University of Hong Kong. Professor Gu has directed and co-directed many Government and Research Council projects in the areas of teacher professional development, school improvement, reform and change. She is currently leading a UK Economic and Social Research Council funded project entitled Schools as Enabling Spaces to Improve Learning and Health Related Quality of Life for Primary School Children in Rural Communities in South Africa. Some of her books have been translated into Chinese, Japanese and Spanish. Her co-authored paper on the impact of school leadership on pupil outcomes was given the William J. Davis Award by the University Council for Educational Administration in 2016. In this lecture, Professor Gu will identify what really matters when it comes to school leadership. She discusses five research-informed claims about successful leadership and school improvements. One of her key messages concerns the persistence of social and economic inequalities and the part schools play. While schools cannot fix all of society's problems, they can do a lot through a leadership culture that tries to close the gap as part of the social contract between education and society. Strong leadership depends on what Professor Gu terms enactment. This means interpreting an often bewildering range of government policies in the context of the school's needs. Leaders play a crucial role in making sense of a complex policy environment in a sensitive and context-dependent way and bringing about change that works for the whole school community. Another important part of successful leadership that Professor Gu emphasises is the need to create a supportive professional learning environment, helping teachers to continue to improve well into their career. As she argues, leadership is secondary to teaching itself and its focus should be about helping others, notably teachers and their pupils, to thrive. I'm very much looking forward to her presentation and the panel discussion that follows her lecture and I'm sure you'll find what follows both enlightening and engaging. Hello everyone, it is an absolute honour and pleasure for me to have the opportunity to give this guest lecture, Shaping Futures of Education, Why Leadership Comes First. The reason I choose um, the topic around futures of education really related to many of the really severe challenges almost every one of us has experienced over the last two to three years, all those lockdowns. And research evidence in education has been telling us those experiences really ampl amplified and highlighted many of the existing challenges and existing inequalities that we already know in our education systems. It's those children in socioeconomically most deprived communities, in marginalized communities, in rural communities, for example, tend to be affected most. And looking forward, what can we do and how can we help them? So we think about the futures of education, we really have to think about those fundamental issues within the society, within the schools, that impact on the stubborn gap that we have known for decades as researchers, as scholars, and as policymakers, um, what really impact on the education attainment of our children. 
the social determinants which are related to family, for example, the social economic backgrounds of the family, education backgrounds of the mother, um, those impacts, you know, a good example would be the quality of early years um, education that children receive before they go to school, their social, um, their social skills, their emotional skills, their emotional development, as well as their learning skills. And I don't have time to really unpack those, but I just wanted us to think around those broader issues around education, thinking about the future. And at a much deeper level, we really have to think about what has caused those inequalities that challenges the quality of the learning and the teaching in every classroom, in every school, in every country of the world. And this is just for me a very beautiful quote, reminding us again, a lot of the seemingly new challenges that we're facing in today's schools, in today's society, can almost have been seen in England, for example, um, in the 19, in Victorian times, and this is a um, picture of a Victorian time um, classroom. You know, they are not too different from many of the classrooms we're seeing today and explaining why pupils and children like Oliver Twist couldn't go to school, whereas children from more um, leafy backgrounds are more likely to receive not only um, schooling, better schooling in school, but also the kind of cultural capital influencing profoundly what they learn and why they learn really well, um, both in school and outside school. So it is really a complex issue. Then think about the, few, the, the futures of our education. This is a very um, interesting and important report, I think, from the UNESCO published um, in November, December last year, inviting us to think about learning as becoming, as a process, as a lifelong learning process, that we should emphasize more about the potentials, emphasize more about the hope and the promise that learning can give us. So it's never end. But more profoundly, if we look at the first bullet point, thinking of education as a social contract, which involves everyone within the society to um, work together to provide the education opportunities and environments that address common challenges, such as the environment, such as health. So that's kind of education almost being defined and redefined again in the crossroads um, when we need to think about what we can do to not only recover the learning poverty and the learning loss that many of our, of our children have suffered, have experienced because of COVID, but moving forward, what kind of a hope and a promise we can give them. So why schools matter? Schools, research has been telling us, the schools really themselves can't fix the deep societal problems that influence deeply many children's learning, whether some children are happy or not, for example. But we also know, even in the most deprived communities, schools can be an oasis. It's a place where children do feel safe, do feel happy, do enjoy their learning. And that's because they are taught by the best teachers. And why schools matter? Because the quality of the schooling, and we have, when we talk about the quality of schooling, the bottom line is what teachers do in the classrooms. And the quality of our teachers really influence profoundly the um, opportunities and the quality of the learning that every child experiences in their classroom, especially for the disadvantaged pupils, as the second bullet point can be seen. We can see from the second bullet point here, for disadvantaged pupils, if they are taught by effective teachers, they can gain an extra year's worth of learning. And bear in mind when their starting point may be lower, and those teachers would enable them to catch up, to kind of narrow the education gap that many of the education systems have really tried to close. So what teachers do in the classroom has the strongest impact on student outcomes. And evidence is telling us school leadership is second only to classroom teaching as an influence on pupil learning. Just think about it. Think who employ our teachers and the most importantly, who create the conditions and the environments that enable many of our teachers and challenge many of our teachers to learn and continue to develop and to feel fulfilled as a professional in the system. It's a school leadership and there has a lot of evidence around those. And the impact of the school leadership is not just within systems where we have single school structures. In England, for example, and also I know in China, 
there have been chains of schools. In England, we have the system called multi-academy trust. So, or in the old days, they are called academy chains. And there has been research looking into groups of schools, you know, school chains, academy chains, and their impact on disadvantaged children and advantaged children, mainly in terms of the social economic advantage or disadvantage. What has been telling us, if we look at single schools, Social economically disadvantaged pupils are more likely to do well if their, if their school is a good and a better school. And that also applies to chains of schools, groups of schools, as evidence um, I've, I've cited here is telling us those school chains, academy chains, that were most successful with disadvantaged pupils also tended to be successful. They are more affluent pupils. What is telling us is if we want to close or narrow the education gap, especially given the disadvantaged pupils a second opportunity, those schools are not necessarily focusing on groups of pockets of children. They are creating a holistic environment, learning environment where everyone can thrive. And that is a very powerful piece of research evidence and telling us also why leadership matters, not just within a single school, but also when we have the whole groups of school structure, the same kind of evidence, the same kind of conclusion can be drawn. So I, I put together four strong claims about successful school leadership. The claims are strong because research evidence is strong. The first one, there are different, there are many differences across different cultures, between and within schools, between countries, but challenges are broadly the same. And here I want to um, focus one specific example about how successful schools, especially successful school leadership, enacts government policy. And here is what I've um, cited and downloaded from the Department for Education website from England. Just look at the sheer numbers of policies that school leaders have to manage, have to deal with and have to address on a daily basis. Not to mention that many of these policies will change and frequently change in some contexts. So the reality is, as research has been telling us, there have been schools, despite the, cha the, the challenges of policy and um, scholars in sociology um, have really written very powerfully about those challenges around, um, around the policy and what the policy challenges have really negatively impacted on schools and on the lives of teachers and school leaders. However, there's another piece of evidence if we look into School effectiveness, school effectiveness and school improvement. Despite the changes of government in the English, in the English system, for example, we know some schools are able to continue to do well and thrive um, despite the policy changes. And that really invited us with my colleague, um, especially um, Christopher Day, looking into um, the meaning of policy enactment, but not from a social ecological perspective, but from school leadership and a school improvement perspective to understand um, policy enactment really for some schools as opportunities for school enablement. We have found and we have argued really strongly based on research evidence from our ESRC funded projects. Policy enactment for those successful schools are not the goal of leadership. It is part of, not an addition to, what is already going on within the school, what the school aspired to achieve and committed to um, achieve over the years. So enactment, as we have conceptualized for, and, and also as we have learned from those successful secondary school principles, enactment as an organizational behavior Within, if we look at how school successful school principles really interpret this, policy itself is a piece of text, and policy often doesn't tell schools and school principles how to um, interpret and how to understand it, and how you actually make it work in your school. And that very process, we argue, is a leadership behavior, is an organizational behavior. So in that process, the principal's role is to diagnose the school's needs, the challenges and priorities, and the strengths and the weaknesses, and then decide, here's the key, whether and how to ignore, adapt, and adopt a policy locally within their context. 
and that process interpretation of the policy text and the decision made in relation to the context of the school will then influence how the policy is um, implemented, is used by their teachers and by their pupils. And I just loved this um, sense-making approach, the kind of um, social cognitive um, approach to understand, to understanding and to making sense um, enactment. And sense-making is a very powerful for me, certainly in our work, in terms of understanding how school leaders in that process of making sense of policy text, what we can see and what we can repeatedly see from many school leaders in our research projects is, is how that sense-making process is linked with the school leaders' identities and their own educational backgrounds, their own educational experiences, and their own school's profiles, and making sense of what the needs and of their school. And here the needs of the school is not just the pupils learning needs, but also the teachers needs, the levels of capacity and the capabilities of the teachers. They are all part of the multiple contexts in which the school leaders sense making is situated. Therefore, then they decide what to adopt, what to adapt and, and on what to ignore in that process. So we have argued in our work, policy enactment in essence is about change and um, is about enacting change. And here's um, an example we have seen from our evaluation of the teaching school policy in the education system in England. Teaching schools are outstanding and good, um, outstanding and good in terms of the national inspection system. Those teaching schools are um, good, primary and secondary special schools, um, they've been designated as teaching schools so that they have the responsibilities to, um, to train and to develop um, early career teachers um, as well as school leaders. And those good and outstanding um, schools in the English system, they don't have to. We know how busy schools are and we know how busy school leaders are and why they have decided to apply, they have the right to the application to become teaching schools and to take on more uh, roles and responsibilities on top of what they already do. And what we have learned from those teaching schools, from their school leaders, is that this is the best CPD opportunity in school. Therefore, they have, in other words, they have applied for this policy opportunity. They have used the funding associated with this policy and to create its opportunity to harness the moral purpose to anchor the core values within their school. And we have many examples in our publications about it. To really harness the internal accountability, not imposed on them, but it really is about what we're for as school, as professionals, and what we're committed to achieve together, to improve, um, to make a difference to the learning and to the lives of their, um, our children. That is you know, the internal accountability. And there are examples of those teaching schools um, using this funding opportunity to grow not just one or two teachers, but everyone has an opportunity. Suddenly, for example, the school becomes an open house. Teachers from other schools come in to observe lessons and to have professional dialogues about what an outstanding lesson looks like. And therefore, the third bullet point is a key. It's the best CPD in school because opportunities have been created to build capacity, to grow the capabilities of not just one or two teachers, but the whole team within the school. And the school therefore become more reflective, outward facing and forward thinking. And in that process of building capacity, everyone feels that they owned this opportunity. You know, you belong to that opportunity and you grow within that opportunity through consultation and communication and across different levels of leadership and teachers within the school. I don't have time to go into details here. So this is a kind of a summary, but what we have then learned is within the teaching school um, responsibilities, um, schools, teaching schools have to take out their best teachers out of the classroom and to um, you know those teachers um, subject leaders they will have to design professional learning opportunities and programs um, for their peers in other schools and there had been worries early in 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 the early um, days um, of the teaching school policy especially parents thinking you know the school has taken out the best teacher out of my children's classroom what would 
what would it might you know mean for the learning of my children would it impact negatively on the learning of my children however what we have learned from the research evidence is after three years compared to similar schools in similar location social economic context teaching schools are doing better significantly based on student outcomes and and that applies to both primary and secondary teaching schools and we believe, we argue, the explanation has been summarized on this slide because it has been used successfully by teaching school leaders as a best CPD to grow the whole capacity of, um, of the school. You know, the country example, as we know from school effectiveness research, that's every school is a great school, even in the most um, underperforming schools, we can still see best practice. But the fundamental difference between effective school and ineffective school is that in ineffective schools, we can see pockets of good practice, whereas in effective schools, because of the capacity building, because of the anchoring of core values, and because of the strong sense of the ownership of the success, the um, good practice is a whole school practice, and that's where you are more likely to see better academic outcomes at the school level. So, you know, accountability, looking, thinking about accountability really has been criticized by, by many scholars, by the professions, thinking about how policy really imposed the external accountability and the pressures and demands on schools. And I'd like to what um, the McKinsey reports kind of inviting us to rethink about accountability. It's not just about account or the matrix that our schools and teachers have to achieve. Think more about the ability, think more about accountability as opportunities to build capacity within our schools for teams. So that takes us to research claim two. Um, almost all successful leaders draw on the same repertoire of basic leadership practices, but there's no single model for achieving success. So there is no formula for a school leader to follow doing one, two, three, four, you will become, you know, you will lead your school to become successful. However, we also know, despite the challenges, despite the differences in contexts, if we look at successful schools and successful school leadership, we see the similar kind of very similar practices, the similar kind of repertoire of um, leadership practices. One of the key, and if not the most important leadership practice is developing people. And just look at the first quote here, good leaders change organizations, great leaders change people. And that is why some schools are able to continue to thrive despite the frequent change of policies, despite exper experiencing similar changes as other schools tend to struggle. And again, this is not new evidence, but it still is one of the most powerful, I think, most convincing research evidence telling us why number four, promoting and participating in teacher learning and development as a leadership practice has the strongest impact. The effect size is 0.84 you know, on student academic outcomes compared with the other um, four leadership practices. And we know in education research, we don't often, because you know, different factors influence the lives of school, the conditions of school, the achievements of our students. Um, you know, although in sometimes in academic, in statistical terms, um, very small, um, uh, it, you know, the factor size seems to be really small, but they're they're equally important. You know, every factor contributes in different ways. However, developing teachers has the strongest impact. And here is another kind of evidence that we have seen from some um, meta-analysis in the UK by the think tank Sutton Trust. There, there, there was a myth that teachers typically improve. We know new teachers are you know, highly committed. They wanted to learn, they wanted to develop. And um, there seems to be some evidence suggesting teachers typically, they plateau after um, three to five years or they leave teaching altogether. However, I mean, this is where, you know, in education, um, in uh, when we teach our own students, MA students and PhD students, it is really important we don't talk about schools. We talk about what kinds of schools and schools in what kind of contexts that we're looking into. Because 
teachers working in schools with more supportive professional environments, for example, they continue to improve significantly after three years. They do not plateau. And they, the counter evidence is also true. So those teachers, if they work in schools where they don't have supportive professional learning um, environments, their effectiveness actually decline. And this is just telling us that when we talk about teacher quality, we really need to place our teachers within the schools. And when we place our teachers within the schools, we have to think about the quality of the school leadership. And I will give you more evidence later in my um, presentation. And here is actually one of the conclusions we've had from our research, leading learning with teacher well-being in mind. Um, leaders are the architects of the social relations and the learning conditions in schools. Developing teachers, for example, we know teachers like children, they tend to learn better when they work in communities, you know, um, when they learn learning, when they feel well, you know, well supported by their peers. Um, so that social relationships teach school leaders are able to create within their schools matter profoundly to um, not only what teachers learn, but how well they can learn. And also related to that is, is the conceptualization of teachers' workload. If we look at the teacher retention and teacher attrition research, um, there has been a lot of evidence seems to suggest that um, workload has been one of the key factors really pushing teachers out of the teaching profession. But we know that teachers are not scared of working hard. And we, I can still remember um, many years ago when I was interviewing a secondary school teacher in East London, she was heavily pregnant. And she said to me, Ching, teaching is a lifestyle. Unless you see it as in that way, you, will, you really are going to struggle. And that's why I put work load as two separate things. Because when we talk about the nature of teacher's work and what has attracted many teachers into teaching, and also what has kept many teachers in the teaching profession is that is the nature of the work that has to be meaningful. The, the, the meaningfulness of, of teachers' work so that they, it's not just about feeling made, matrix, for example, they can see why they are doing it and what they are doing is contributing to their own learning and contributing to the learning of their own children. Therefore, it is motivational. And of course, it has to be manageable in terms of how much they do and how the schools are actually creating the systems that enable teachers to feel their workload is manageable. But if we talk about the nature of the work, the emphasis is really are placed on the meaningfulness of what teachers do. So, and that is linked profoundly to the nature of the learning. And here's another example I wanted to share. Um, it's based on um, a kind of a national survey that we have conducted in our evaluation of research schools. Um, research schools is, is another kind of um, uh, uh, group of schools that the English system has, has created. They are, again, you know, good and outstanding primary and secondary schools. Those school leaders are really committed to evidence-based um, um, teaching and learning and leadership. So they've been designated as, as research schools. One of their key um, uh, responsibility is to provide external CPD. And the quality of their professional learning and development based on our evaluation perceived by participants um, seem to be you know, high quality. So here is the, the box we, we did. So we surveyed participants of those CPD programs provided by research schools in order to understand um, to what extent and in what ways those teachers' participation in those um, CPD programs really impact on change in teachers' practice and ultimately improvement in student learning and engagement. But what we have found is the CPD itself does not result in change in teachers' practice. It does impact on teachers' individual teachers' understanding of research use, because you know, that's the content of the CPD. But the individual um, improved understanding does not result directly on teachers' change in practice. I could not draw a causal relationship in there. What it does is the individual learning contribute to the culture and the collective capacity within the school. And it is a culture and a capacity within the school impact on result in teachers' changed practice. And that changed practice then 
um, subsequently impact on student learning and engagement. Under the culture is the, you know, the, the research use culture and the collective capacity within the school also impact directly on student learning and, and um, engagement. But what also importantly, what this structural equation model is telling us, the antecedent for all of this to take place is leadership support for professional learning and development. There's no game planning. Schools, school leadership that focus on supporting professional learning and development is the antecedent that also link to better offset national inspection school um, grading. So um, schools that have better, more supportive professional learning development um, cultures, more likely to see better offset outcomes when they judge um, the grading of a school. And it is the leadership support for the broader professional learning and development then shaped in this particular case, um, uh, research use culture and a practice within the school and really um, enhanced the culture and the collective capacity. And it is the culture that impacts on individual teachers changing practice and student um, engagement and learning. It kind of almost um, reminds us the evidence from CPD, from school leadership, from, um, from teacher learning and development, you know, sending individual teachers out to attend external CPD often we found does not result in um, improved student learning outcomes. There has been a lot of criticism, especially in the last five years, looking at the weaknesses um, of the human capital approach to teacher development, you know, large scale um, CPD opportunities that schools are sending teachers in. But um, we struggle as a system to see how those heavy investment, financial investment, human resources investment on external CPD really resulted in improved, uh, improved teacher change in practice and improved student outcomes. And we think this structural equation model that we have um, um, really developed from our evaluation in the English system um, contributes to that debate because it is really the school teachers thrive um, and stay within the school context that follow up of learning and to what extent school has a culture and a collective capacity, collective social relations that enable teachers to use the individual learning in their classrooms to make a difference to students' uh, engagement and learning matters. Okay, so that takes us to research claim three, principles achieve and um, sustain success through who they are and the combination and accumulation of various, um, various relatively small effects of the school leadership influence different aspects of school improvement processes in the same direction. What it says, there are many things that really influence school improvement processes. But what we have learned from those successful schools is the influence um, within the school improvement process. They are influencing towards one direction that is improving um, students' academic outcomes, kind of interactively supporting each other to create the right environments, the right conditions that enable teachers' behavior standards to improve, enable learners' behavior and motivation to improve, and ultimately um, enable student outcomes to improve. And that all starts with the school principles um, practice and um, you know, both in terms of the rational practices as well as leadership trust. And here is the more um, unpack, you know, the simplified model. And I will try to you know, quickly explain, it may look quite complex, but if you look at the colors, there are only four layers in the structural equation model that we have developed trying to understand the impact of principles leadership on student um, improvement on the improvement in student outcomes. The first layer is the school principal, um, school principal's leadership, setting directions and redesigning the organization achieved through developing people. You know, use of pupil data, use of classroom observation have been used to develop um, teachers within schools. And this is the rational aspect of leadership practice. What is also interesting is the school principal's trust in teachers. Um, and remember, when we did our research, this is impact of school leadership on student outcomes. But through sampling, we only looked at the schools, um, secondary as well as primary schools that have demonstrated um, significant improvement over the last three years in student outcomes. So by the time we entered the school, they were already successful schools. 
and therefore trust has already been built in those schools you know uh, before our research so that trust has become a very important emotional condition and culture that enable the school to you know influence the school improvement processes to make a difference and i'm just quickly going to show you we replicated the same study in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, in all the schools, all the secondary schools in the real state. And the trust is here. That is where it is one of the conditions that a school principals strive to achieve to impact on student outcomes. But when we look at successful schools, our study in the English system, um, because the schools were already successful all the time based on our very strict sampling criteria, trust here is a condition. So we think about trust, it is, um, it is a process, you know, you build a trust. And once trust has been built, it has become, um, it is an outcome as well as the condition that enable distribution of school leadership to take place in, uh, in the school improvement process and in our sample in here. So the second layer, the orange layer, is related to distribution of school leadership to senior leadership team, as well as to staff, to all the teachers. And the distribution of leadership impacts then creates the third layer of the blue boxes. They are the conditions within the school. I hope nothing will surprise you. Teacher collaborative culture, assessment for learning, improvement in school conditions, external collaboration and learning opportunities. They then impact on the fourth layer of the green boxes. They are the intermediate outcomes. We have to have higher learner motivation, higher academic standards, and the children will have to want to come to school, pupil attendance, and they also you know, have to behave well in, in the classroom. And, and here's a quite important thing. You know, when we talk about pupil behavior, it's not a just um, a kind of rules and regulations in a school. In here is telling us, it is also a culture. Pupil behavior is a culture. If learning and if teaching and learning is exciting, is motivational, is aspiring, children are more likely to behave well in the classroom. And therefore, we're more likely to see better academic outcomes. And that is what we meant about you know, different leadership practices matter in different ways, strong, larger or small, but they are pushing the school improvements um, in ways to create the right conditions, the right environments that enable the intermediate outcomes to, you know, to take place. Um, and finally, for us to see better academic outcomes. And finally, Let's talk about leadership equity or equitable leadership. School leaders positively influence improvements and equity in their schools in almost everything they do, but not just through some practices um, that are uniquely designed for improving equity. So I highlight the key here is, as we demonstrated earlier, about disadvantaged children are more likely to do better in good and better schools. Yeah. So under the research evidence based on Professor Ken Leithwood's um, latest literature um, review, looking at equitable school leadership and especially successful school leadership, he has identified that those school leaders are not only focusing on equity, they are focusing on um, creating the conditions and processes. They are building a successful school. It is within those successful schools that we are more likely to see disadvantaged um, children, students doing better, of course, but he's also identified two um, sets of leadership practices, their effect sites in relation to equity seems to be um, stronger. I hope they won't surprise you because one of them is about productive partnerships with the, with the community. Of course, you, you know, engaging parents, parental support. We know those um, are especially important for disadvantaged children because um, that's where the challenges tend to be. Um, the second is about making the teaching and learning ambitious and culturally responsive. And finally, I just wanted to um, conclude my um, lecture with five leadership opportunities that brought together by our visiting professor Christine Gilbert in her think piece organized by our leadership center. You know, it's um, we think he's kind of broadly summarized all the five, you know, five really key dimensions of leadership opportunities that our schools have to think about when they try to um, shape the futures of education for 
all the children in their schools. So it's about rooting schools at the heart of their communities. It's about tackling growing inequalities. It's about harnessing the power of technology, preparing children better for life and learning and strengthening capacity through collaboration. And this is um, my favorite slides of this lecture. These photos were taken in our South African research project funded by the ESRC, looking at schools as enabling spaces for children in rural, for primary school children in rural communities in South Africa. And really, I've learned a lot from this research project, but at the heart of that is how these adults in those photos. They are community members employed by schools, by the Department for Education as reading champions. They are committed for, there's some very powerful evidence from those interviews. Some of these young people telling us working with children have, has really reshaped their understanding of their career, of, of what they want to achieve in their lives, because they can see education gives hope and promise to those young children. And they want it, some of them want to become, want to be trained to become teachers. And what we have learned from that project really is what I um, explained at the beginning of my lecture, education is um, and has to be a social contract involving everyone from our communities, from our schools and from our societies to give the hope and promise that all our children deserve. And thank you very much for listening to me. Bye bye. Well, good afternoon, uh, panel, and thank you very much for that talk, uh, Ching. It was fascinating. It was full of research and rich insights, and we all very, very much enjoyed it, and I'm sure the rest of the audience will too. Uh, my name's Alan Walker, and it's my pleasure now to lead a short discussion around just some of the, the key points of Ching's talk. We don't have much time, so we'll get on with it. So first of all, let me introduce the panel who have just watched your talk. You take a breath for a minute and get over that long talk, okay? Our first panel member is Daniel Chan Wing Kong. Daniel is one of the most experienced principals in Hong Kong. And at present, he's the head of Polang Cook Laws Foundation College in Chun Kwan Ho. So welcome, Daniel, and thank you for your time. No Our second panel member is uh, Dr. Darren Bryant. Darren's the head of department of the Department of Educational Policy and Leadership at the Education University of Hong Kong. Darren's area of expertise is school leadership with a focus, a very strong focus at the moment on middle leaders. So Darren, thank you for making the time as well. And our third panellist is Dr. Kian Haiyan. Haiyan is the director of the Asia Pacific Centre for Leadership and Change, also at Education University of Hong Kong. She's also in the field of school leadership, and her particular expertise is leadership and organisation in Chinese society. So thank you for coming, Haiyan, as well. Now, I've asked everyone to keep their questions and responses as brief as possible, succinct, deep, but brief. So, Daniel, if you have a question, how about you start us off and get the ball rolling? Thanks, Daniel. Okay. Um, good leaders change the organisation and good leader, great leader change people. Yes, indeed. We can't bring along change to the organization without the orchestrating effort of people therein. Being served as a principal in Hong Kong during the past three decades, I have experienced lots of policy change. Policy enactment is, in essence, about change. However, whether the change will bring along opportunities or threats, to the organization depends very much on, upon how leaders of the school can facilitate the dispersal of power, the engagement of both external and internal participants in generating dialogue. To harness the moral purpose as stated in Professor Gore's uh, presentation, drawing for, from your research, would you please enlighten us why is it very important to have the necessity of freedom of each of the member of the school and the equality of the community in the learning community? My second question is, 
how would these two principles have a mutual reinforcing relations with each other? Maybe just answer one of those questions, please, Jing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Principal Daniel, and thanks, Alan. It's, it's a very deep reflection. Um, uh, I just wanted to say, um, to start with, I what we have learned from, from our research about school leadership and, and improvement, um, relationships are the social glue of a community, whether we're saying it's community between school and um, the school external community or about the learning community within a school, community among teachers, community among, um, among students. And that takes us to, um, I think conceptually, um, it's necessary for me to share my thinking around what community is. Um, what we conceptualize community is, there's a strong focus on relationships as you have outlined and also the bonds. And I think more importantly, the individual as well as collective identities of individuals within the communities of learning, and which will also address the individual as well as the shared common interests that bring people together in a place or through a kind of activity. Um, so that's then drawing from there to think about what learning communities mean. Um, there's a lot of research around professional learning communities, but I think what's at heart of the argument is, is for us to think what the learning community provides um, as an important source of collective identification emphasizing the collective identities of, of individual teachers or, or individual students um, so that they have a strong sense of belonging. And that sense of belonging, that relational connection between individuals provides the necessary social foundations for equal opportunities or equality, as you have outlined as a principle of community. And I think, um, so what do we mean? Again, what made me think in your reflection, what do we mean by equality um, or equal opportunities for learning? And I think what, what is perhaps more important for education, for educators thinking of um, communities of learning for students, for example, is to ask the question equality of what? You know, are we more concerning the equality of resources or equal opportunities of access, um, satisfaction of learning or quality of life? And to what extent these equal opportunities are able to eliminate disadvantage? And I think I kind of emphasized quite strongly um, in, in, our, in our research, the importance of understanding the social, the deep social and societal factors that underpin inequality, um, many of which schools can't um, resolve themselves. Although schools do provide a different opportunity, especially for disadvantaged children. And I think in the context of thinking about communities of learning, when we think about equality and equal opportunities and the equality of what, it is also necessary for educators to think about another related concept, which is equity. I think equality and equity have to go hand in hand together when we look at um, learning communities, especially, for example, for children. Um, equality emphasizing equal treatment. You know, we can think about that in research design, in design um, of assessment. But we also acknowledge from our research there are, there are fundamental worries if we don't consider equity because equity emphasize, um, emphasizes meeting the needs of individual students. So whether treating each student equally is the correct and appropriate way forward when we think about learning, think about meeting the needs of learning, think about curriculum design, thinking about creating that sense of community and belonging to motivate the student to learn. So recognizing the diverse students' needs, the equity issues should really go hand in hand with our concerns for equality. Thank you very um, much, Jing, for that. That's, um, 
the the importance for us to consider both equality and equity to build inclusive schools that meet. And I think that's a great point, and I really hope that we get more research going on that. So thank you for your question and thank for you for your thoughtful response, uh, Ching. Darren, we might move on to you now and see if you have a question about the presentation. Yes, that, thanks so much, uh, Professor Gu, for, for your presentation. What I found really intriguing were the models that you presented in the latter half of the presentation based on the UK data. And one thing that, that I... I reflected on when I looked at the model is, is when I interact with principals and, and particularly, uh, I, I guess, aspiring principals, and we present these sorts of models to them, they'll say, oh, yes, of course, um, building trust is important, but, but how do I do it, right? And, and because these models, I think, are so interesting because you're, you're presenting them uh, based on data collected from schools at the end of a three-year period of growth, going from maybe uh, uh, not so highly performing schools to successful schools. So I'm wondering, in, in, in your research, did you encounter one or two common challenges that principals raised as they were trying to, to build up uh, these sorts of structures in their schools and, and, and how might they have accounted for it or addressed those challenges? Um, it's a fascinating question and quite hard to answer, I have to confess. Um, and if I could start with the success. Because, um, um, you know, you mentioned um, we, in our work, we look at successful school leadership. And I think it is important um, when we think about challenges and success, success itself is also a fluid and a dynamic concept because context change and therefore challenges will change with it. Um, and therefore in our work, the, the concept, the identification of schools' um, faces of improvement, we found that really helpful because that enabled us to look at the key characteristics of success as well as challenges relating to the context. And here I also wanted to emphasize context that does not simply mean the school intake communities. Um, because you know we know there are challenges, those especially for schools serving socioeconomically more disadvantaged communities, those kind of challenges are constant. They don't go away. And to build a trust within the school and within the community, that is a constant challenge for school leaders that, that you know the foot can't be off the pedal. Um, but context also refers to um, it is important, I think, when we think about school leadership and improvement, to think of the structural and policy context, as, as Principal Daniel mentioned at the beginning, in that context also change, um, you know, quite frequently and, and often, um, you know, fragmented, creating a quite fragmented policy context for schools. There is also the third dimension of context, I think, which often... Um, in research, um, we don't talk as much, is the internal context of the school, which refer to um, the capacity, the culture and the capability of the staff. You know, for example, um, um, key staff may move on changing schools and that can constantly create another dimension of dynamics for school principals to manage. And it is the interaction between the, you know, the different aspects of context, really challenging school leaders um, in different ways um, and in different phases of their um, school improvement. If I just quickly take the foundational phase at the beginning, you know, in, 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 if we look at the research around ten around schools, um, building trust was often the first step. But trust is, is, is a verb as well as a noun. And trust, because building trust is a process. It takes 10 years to build trust, at, you know, possibly 10 seconds to, to break it. But be, once the trust has been built, it is a outcome as well as then function as a noun, a condition for further things to, um, to take place. And anchoring the vision of the um, the vision and the values of the school, the ownership of the change, as well as 
continued emphasis on building and enhancing the capacity, the capability of the staff. Together, they build, they help to contribute to build the trust and, and create the kind of relational foundation that a successful school would need to carry on to move on. I hope I've um, answered that succinctly, um, Alan. Yes, thank you very much, Tim. The, the importance of trust. And of course, to get a successful school, we need to combine trust with that agency in terms of teachers for it to turn it into proper outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Ching. Um, Chen Haiyan, do you have a question that you'd like to ask now? Thanks, Ching, uh, for your talk. And uh, um, uh, my question is also about successful school principalship, because you, in, in your talk, you have mentioned one of the claims is that successful school principals know how to combine, sequence, or time their strategies. And it seems that all these successful principals, they have a, a wide range of repertoire of, uh, uh, of strategies in their toolbox. So I think actually um, in, my, in our research in the Chinese societies, we often have similar findings. Or when I talk to successful principals like Daniel, I also um, similarly sometimes really feel amazed that they, they have that wisdom. So um, in your opinion, how, um, how have these successful principals accumulated um, their repertoire? So, so that they can make decisions about um, when and how to combine and sequence their strategies. Um, I, how, how has your research informed you of this? Um, hi, you gave me the most difficult question. Um, I think um, looking back, um, just thinking about how we constructed the layered leadership concepts, you know, you, 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 um, Darren and, and Alan have also been uh, doing similar work in Hong Kong. It's, um, I think, you know, for school principals to, um, if I say, there are three things we have learned. Um, one is there isn't a formula to um, become a successful leader because they need to learn to read the context. If anything, that's pos possibly the first lesson that they, they know they have to learn it well, to read the context and make um, professional judgments on the capacity, the cultural capability, you know, the internal context of the school, as well as the external context so that they're able to decide um, the strategies and practices that are fit for purpose. It may, it may sound really um, abstract and vague, but that's certainly something we have learned in that accumulation of leadership practices, you know, to, to be able to read the context, that certainly is the first lesson. And those who are able to read well and, and, and then implement leadership practices that are responsive to the needs of the context would, would to see, um, you know, are more likely to see their schools improve um, over time. And second, as, as you have actually identified in your observation, there are, you know, context matters. Um, in school improvement. However, if we look over time and across different national contexts, let alone within one within one country across different social social economic contexts, for example, for schools, there are similar leadership practices that we can identify from successful leaders, and these are despite the difference in context. So, you know, we have to think about the first lesson, the second lesson together. You know, there, there's no formula, but there are common practices. We know they work. And thirdly, related to that is um, the fixed leadership models are not helpful. I know that I may um, leadership and, and the management programs across um, quite a few universities I have been associated with and worked with, um, students um, are bombarded with different kind of leadership models. But I think one of the things we have certainly learned from our research is um, the you know, leaders who are able to make context sensitive um, decisions actually apply different 
practices and strategies, those fixed model um, is, you know, I think of the latest work, for example, Candy Thought has written for our encyclopedia around, is around um, integrated school leadership, you know, what works. Um, and related to that, it is important, I think, I can't emphasize enough, is for school leaders, in the when they are developing their leadership insights, it is necessary and important that they are able to see the system and understanding the connections between different leadership practices as you know, at a moment in time, as well as over time, to see how the connections between different leadership strategies, as we have presented in our models, influence different aspects of school improvement processes in the same direction. So that's, you know, each, each small effect, each small school condition, you know, large or small they have created, are able to function as a foundation for the next um, phase of success to take place. Thank you very much, Jing. Great. I mean, it's about the, uh, we're talking about the, the accumulation and the retention and the enactment of wisdom in answer to Hai An's question, I think, and how that is woven together within a specific school context. And that's almost regardless of what the external context is. Um, we've got time for one more very quick question. Darren, did you have one burning there? Maybe I'll just pick up on your last point about different practices influencing different aspects of school improvement. And I'm really curious about this one on, on redesigning organizations in the UK context, because it, it seems to have an impact on a lot of other practices. And so I guess a similar question to my last in a way was, were, were there any standout changes that principals made in structures that, that, that help to create conditions for improvement. Thank you, Derek. That reminds me of your own paper in our special issue on how successful school, schools impact policy. I think there's a strong emphasis, certainly in the UK context, talking about restructuring the organization. There's strong emphasis on developing and sustaining the collaborative cultures um, within the school. And often, as you have argued in your work, is the enactment of school principles' own values. And when we look at the, um, for example, the timetables of a school and the staffing structure of the school, that often tells us a lot about the values um, of the leadership. For example, um, you know, we have examples of uh, school principals um, provide regular opportunities and encouragements for teachers to work together on improvements of teaching and learning. They establish different teams and group structures for problem solving um, and create um, the resources and the time for communities of learning to take place in their school. And, and also, there are also times we, we, we see principals participate with the staff in their own collaborative teaching improvement work. And finally, there are you know, many examples of distributing school leadership for selected tasks in schools. And that kind of together, they create um, a kind of environment that enable um, the school principal um, to really enact their value um, that would fulfill the moral purpose of what the school stands for. Fantastic, thank you. And that fits very nicely with lots of work in Hong Kong, Darren and Ian, et cetera, are doing, looking at the place of educational infrastructure and the shape of that infrastructure in schools to build up that sort of community of learners. All right, thank you, Darren, for that extra uh, question. I think you've asked fascinating questions. We couldn't get in deep enough, but we had some very astute responses. They certainly got me thinking, and I believe they will others. So I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you very, very much for the, the lecture, Ching. We, we, we know it's a big one. Um, we would have loved to have had you in here in Hong Kong doing it, but we couldn't have that. So we, we appreciate you putting it online so that everyone can watch it. We appreciate it very much. And thank you, Daniel, for your time from a uh, very busy principal schedule and to Darren and Haiyan for their insightful comments. We look forward to much more discussion 
in different forums over the year. And if anyone watching the video has further questions, please go ahead and type them in on YouTube and we'll see what we can do to get those answers. So thank you again. Thank you, Ching. Thank you, panel. Really good session. We'll see you again another time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to thank Professor Ching Gu for her inspiring presentation, which helps us to better understand what makes leadership successful. I would also like to thank the discussion panelists, Professor Alan Walker, Dr. Darren Bryant, Dr. Qian Haiyan, and Principal Chan for their highly engaging discussion. Along with the closure of this lecture, this also marks the end of the Distinguished Visiting Professors online series for 2022. It has given us the opportunity to listen to, meet and learn from some of the most interesting and inspirational thinkers in education today. It's been a huge pleasure to hear and learn from our speakers and to discuss the issues that they've raised. This series of lectures has given us much to think about in the context of our own lives, our work settings and our communities. Thank you and goodbye.